Hello and welcome to the Media Podcast. I'm Matt Teagan. On the show today, Kate Gates. Uh, what does this latest Photoshop faux pas tell us about media consumers and levels of trust in the media? Uh, also on the program, the Telegraph Media Group deal is not yet done, uh, as our government intends to legislate to keep the titles out of foreign government hands. So is the race back on? Uh, all that, plus we look at how British TV is reacting to AI, uh, why Newsnight could become a podcast, and in the media quiz, we choose our pick of the pot. Uh, That's all to come in this edition of the Media Podcast. In the news this week, TikTok has been dealt a blow by the US House of Representatives after it overwhelmingly passed a law to force Chinese owners ByteDance uh, to divest control within 165 days. Uh, The company said that the legislation amounts to a total ban of TikTok in the United States. Elon Musk has fired X's new star Don Lemon uh, before the show has even aired one episode. And the reason for the sudden U-turn? Lemon was tasked with interviewing the billionaire, saying his commitment to a global town square where where all questions can be asked and all ideas can be shared seems not to include questions of him from people like me. Uh, and set your air fryers to 200 degrees, Channel 4 have announced that Jamie Oliver will be hosting a two-parter on the subject that has been a commissioner's dream over the past few months. Uh, Oliver has partnered with TFAL on this short-run series. And joining me at the London Podcast Studios to cover the other media stories this week, we welcome back Rebecca Cooney, inside Editor of Broadcast. Hello. Hello, how's it going? Uh, very very good, thank you. Uh, I was uh, looking at some things that you've been writing and you were at the London TV screenings. Yes, yeah, so I wasn't quite at the London TV screenings. Okay. My colleague John was going to more of the screenings than I was, but sort of doing a lot of the coverage around it. So yeah, we do a, a hot picks where we ask the distributors to send us the things they think ah, are going to yes. sell the best. Um, and then we kind of pick our favourites, but we also look at what can we tell from the submissions about what is it the distributors think are, is going to be the big the big hitting titles. Yes, well, what's, well, what's the trend for the next 80, 12, 18 months then? It seems to have all got a bit serious, to be oh. honest. Um, so, you know, a couple of years ago, we were sort of talking about sort of previous thing at uh, MIPCOM and Cannes. There was lots of, um, there was a bit of a more of a move towards comedy, towards mm. kind of, or, or, or dramedy, which is a portmanteau that I really hate, but, you know, that sort of comedy <laughs> drama bent. Whereas this seems to be kind of, a lot more uh, in the way of sort of thrillers in the way of kind of you know true crime that sort of thing and which obviously true crime is perennially popular Mm. but that's sort of and it's a theory that I've heard recently that people are looking for escapism either in kind of warm and fluffy or in I'm going to embrace the darker side of life in this way and then not think about how it's happening in the real world sort of thing so I think that's kind of what they seem to be thinking Uh, and next to Rebecca we have Press Gazette's UK editor Charlotte Tobit hello hi Matt Um, you've been speaking to Jamie East friend of the show uh, this week about um, his landing at the Daily Mail and everything he's been up to with podcasts yeah it sounds quite exciting Uh, what's he up to so literally like this time last year or yeah the Daily Mail was doing the trial of Lucy Letby this kind of really unusual and um yeah, unprecedented podcast where they're following the trial of Lucy Letby as it's going on, like every mm. day there's a new podcast. And then, um, but the de- mail didn't really have anything else in place with podcasts. Um, and then, and that worked. Um, and then they hired Jamie last summer. Um, and he's come in, um, he's basically been given kind of a vision from the owner, Lord Rothermere, of, of how everything should connect. He's said, he, he was very complimentary to Lord Rolman saying like he actually walks the walk on wanting to be a 360 degree company mm. whereas other companies just say the words um, and so yeah he's been given like creative freedom and he's building out a whole audio strategy they've got I think uh, I think it's four other podcasts have started since he's joined and he said they've got 19 in pre-production so quite a lot it's to come it's a big old that, site yeah I mean he, he literally said like I can't think of another comparable company doing that number or planning that number so um i think it will be one to watch and you know he does admit that like they're not all going to be um massive successes and they won't all be like the trial of lucy let be which got loads of admiration but you know even if just a few are then that's that's pretty good going so you've got to plant a lot of seeds don't you to, to yeah get these things to work he did say like there's no shame in cancelling a podcast mm. if it doesn't work because i think a lot of people kind of get s- stuck on it and and um think it's embarrassing to stop it but actually you know if you think about it if it's not doing that well not many people have seen it anyway so yes it doesn't matter that much just <laughs> just try a new thing or you know learn something from that and then move on so yeah i think it'll be interesting to see what what the mail 
and its sister titles comes up with scene. And also it's quite interesting, isn't it? The mail um, sort of went private again mm. or sort of reacquired all of the, the shares from other shareholders. It does give you, if you're the owner of everything, you get to decide, don't you? You get to decide where the money goes if you're going to invest something into the business. It's easier to, to make that happen when you don't have to worry about everyone else. Exactly. I think it gives it means that they can have a longer term vision rather than thinking about the next kind of year's financial mm. results and and profit for just that year and um, being able to invest and then think well in a few years that will really pay off and it'll future proof us that is just something that would be harder to do if it was still public well we start today uh, with kate gate of course we are <laughs> uh, the princess of wales apologized this week for a photo released by the palace that had been the subject of a kill notice by ap which sounds very dramatic um charlotte what is a kill notice so basically it's when the agencies say this photo doesn't meet our editorial standards you shouldn't use it get rid of it you know pull it from publication or uh, from your uh, internal systems make sure it isn't used again obviously m- this is a slightly unusual case in that the photo was distributed by Kensington Palace on social mm. media so I think it's a bit harder to just tell people don't use it but I think it shows that the agencies don't want to have been seen to have verified it when um, they realise that there are all these issues with it. And, you know, like hearing some of them speak afterwards, like they were like, literally, the problems with it are so obvious, actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, I mean, it's pretty serious. I mean, um, Phil Chetwind on, uh, from AFP, um, sorry to mention it, but on the media show uh, this week, he the did... The other one. The other one. <laughs> the other place, I think that's how <laughs> yeah. you to refer to it. But it was very good because he, he literally spoke about how the agencies had like met up on a Zoom call oh. before doing this, Ooh. which I didn't realise. Mm. So um, it wasn't like one of them went and then they all followed. Like they did agree, yeah, you're right, that is dodgy. Let's, let's distance ourselves from that. Um, and he also said that like... Um, it happens so rarely, this kill, sort of kill notice, and it's usually f- uh, from p- pictures issued from like the North Korean agency yes. and m- m- Russia, you know, places that you wouldn't normally trust. I mean, I, I guess sort of as a layman with this, you sort of feel that aren't all photos sort of touched up or 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 changed? Like what, what pushed this over the edge for them to sort of react in quite a dramatic fashion? So there's a difference between like, touching up slightly like maybe the lighting or something Mm. and changing the like truth of the story like a photo like if they think it casts any doubt on you know whether that scene actually happened Mm. then do you think that's that's their concern that you know we've used google's like pick the best smiles of all the children well i think the problem is that they just don't know and they asked kensington palace for the unedited photo and Mm. they didn't provide it so in that case you just can't trust it you can't go well it might be fine you know i think it's right for them to have a hard line on this because their entire product is built on trust both from the audiences that ultimately see their pictures and and other content and from the publishers that work with them so if I think it's that if they take a strong position on this, then they would on every other piece of content mm. as well. I think it's the yeah. precedent. I mean, it's like a relatively minor story, but at the same time... like, Well, it, it fits was, into the whole eco-drama of it all, Yes, it? but I just was thinking like like that thing about editorial standards, like if it was a photo of, I don't know, a police officer at a protest with his fist raised and you change the angle mm. of the fist, that, mm. is, that may well change the nature of the story. So they obviously have to draw a line somewhere mm. and go, we're just not taking photos where you've messed around with where people's arms I, might be. Or I mean, Rebecca, it's interesting from a sort of consumer perspective. Mm. Um, yeah, as was said, it was published on the Instagram. They sort of sent it out to the to, to the public. Do they sort of understand that because it's come from them, it's likely to have been touched up and doesn't, and this doesn't really matter? Oh, I think because there's been so much speculation, hasn't there? Because, you know, Kate has been sort of off work because she's mm. been having operation and everyone's gone, well, where is she? Where is she? And you just think the one thing you need to do when you put a photo out is not have it obviously have been altered digitally in some way. Do you know what I mean? This is the one thing that probably would have shut up a lot of that speculation. Yes, I mean, they have managed to complicate the story even more. You have the, kind of, the wedding ring scenario, um, how how truthful is, is the picture. Mm. And then I thought it was interesting. I, I said uh, on a call uh, with some colleagues, they went, I bet you they get her out today. You know, the sort of mm. proof of life type, uh, she is fine shot. But then that was even sort of mucked up, really, because she was sort of looking the wrong way in, in the car. And everyone goes, oh, it's a, it's a plant, you know, it's not a, a real person, which is probably 
very much untrue. But they seem to continually mess this up. Yeah, I think it's an absolute PR disaster. Yeah. Like, it's not as if they're new to this. No, yeah. I mean, yeah, they should have some of the best PRs in the country, mm. frankly. And, and <laughs> I just, when I saw the story came up on BBC on my phone and I just thought, oh, I'm going to have a look at this photo, see if I can spot it. I bet I won't be able to. Oh my God, okay, that sleeve looks really weird. <laughs> it, took, it took like me just pinching out on my phone and going, oh, yeah, I can see that. And I'm not, you know, a picture person. I'm not a picture editor. I'm not a designer. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, I, I can kind of see what's wrong with that. You just think like there must be somebody else who can go, you want to put that photo out? Of course, Your Highness. Can I just take a look? What have you done to it? Yeah, and I can see that's happened Maybe not. I mean, Charlotte, but some of the papers, they published the photo for later, for early editions, didn't they? Or mm. late editions. Um, they didn't sort of spot anything. And then it was kind of everybody jumping on, on social media to then point it out. I guess it's partly that thing of like Kensington Palace w- was, probably not is anymore, a trusted source to them. So they wouldn't... F- Feel the, why mm. would you? There's no precedent to be zooming in and, and checking those things. Like, unless you're thinking to look mm. for it, as conspiracy theorists on the internet were the first, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, yes, it started with them, but it it was right. Um, you know, why would they? And um, generally, you'd take photos like that from, uh, like, the palace and, and other reliable sources in good faith. But it does make the point um, that press photographers have been talking about this week of, like, just handout images being... Mm. An issue. It's also an issue with like um, Downing Street. They have an official photographer for the Prime Minister, and sometimes they exclude like independent press photographers from being at like big moments. But then we'll hand out these pictures from mm. Number Ten's photographer, and obviously there's just a level of trust with those photos that you don't have compared to press photographers where you trust them because there are, you know that there are certain procedures they would always do and not do. Uh, well, there's more on this story and the Royal PR operation, plus tabloid fakery in the Two Mats podcast. Matt Kelly and Matt Dancone, if you want to get more of that in the Two Mats. Uh, okay, moving on to another soap opera, uh, this time at The Telegraph. Uh, will they, won't they, uh, be bought by a Redbird IMI? We've covered it on the show uh, quite a bit. This is the UAE-backed consortium. Um, Charlotte, what's the latest? So, first... I mean, it is a sorry, isn't it? It's like, oh. <laughs> But, but I feel what like, is it now? I don't know if it was ago. the last time I was on this podcast or the time before. I feel like I did a whole <laughs> spiel about where it was at as well. But um, but firstly, this week, Bloomberg had a report saying that News UK and, um, again, back to Lord Rothermere's DMGT, um, with, were considering or in talks to um, kind of pitch in to Redbird IMI's deal. And that would result in reducing their stake, which might make the deal more palatable to uh, the government mm. um, scrutinising it. Um, it's not clear, like, how reliable that report is. Like, I think DMGT did say, well, you know, we're not in talks with them or, you know, so I, I don't know. But it was a very it interesting report. would be a neat report. solution. Yeah, you can see the logic. Um, and obviously at News UK, it seems that they're most interested in the spectator mm. and that angle with it. Um, but then, so... Midweek, I think it well, I think Wednesday, um, in the Lords, where the Digital Markets Bill has been having its um, kind of third reading, Tina Stahl was bringing in an amendment that would kind of just stop foreign government ownership altogether. And then the government said, "We are doing this. We we are going to like staple uh, it onto the, the yeah, bill, so, yeah, yeah. So it's it's you know, it obviously doesn't like cite the Telegraph specifically, but yeah. it's it's about foreign state ownership. I think it's unclear whether it would stop even that minority stake mm. um, or, or whether whether they can be involved at all or whether they just can't have a majority stake. I think there are still a few question marks, but basically I mean, it's a game changer. It, it is. I mean, it really causes them trouble. I and mean, I look at it and you've got, you know, Russian owners of the Evening Standard. You've got Australian owners of The Sun and The Sunday Times. This has been designed to stop a single deal uh, rather than think... But more about the, the the true nature of media plurality in the UK. This is and this is also Tories and their mates, isn't it? You know, this is the Telegraph's an important Tory title, uh, and they've managed to get the government to do what they want. Yes, yeah, so, I mean it has been a very political issue like you and you know why they've done it but equally you know it is different to those ones you cite and the FT's owned by a Japanese mm, country, okay. uh, company yep. as well but it's different to them obviously because it's a foreign state like um mm, okay. uh, and UAE royal and member of government mm. that is kind of it and it, you know this is obviously isn't part of it it's all foreign states but the very fact that UAE have kind of press freedom concerns as well there's 
it, it, that it, it is different to all those other kind of foreign owned companies in, in, in a very key way. Um, I mean, you, you wouldn't even want a U, the UK government to buy it, you know, would you? So kind of what's the difference? They, did, they, did, they have said that Norwegian wealth funds, they're okay to do what they want. That was the most important thing. <laughs> well, Norway's very lovely and Of calm, course, so. of course. Um, Rebecca, I mean, obviously this is about newspaper groups, but um, Redbird are in for other acquisitions, aren't they? They've got their eye on All3 Media. They have indeed. So All3 Media is one of the kind of super indie groups that mm. owns a lot of production companies in the UK. Um, and it is just going to be a massive deal if it goes through, absolutely. I suppose there's probably less concern because there is that issue about press freedom which is slightly different to tv production um and there's kind of been slightly less noise about it but yeah it is interesting that they do seem to be kind of uh yeah kind of getting their fingers in a lot of media pies there no concern from the prime minister about uae's interference with midsummer murders though <laughs> no but i think that could be fun actually that'd be really interesting <laughs> Maybe they're taking a slightly watch. different direction yeah um uh, just before we take a break we saw this week that bbc news podcast chief jonathan aspen wall uh, is to lead the new look news night team um Rebecca, the their audio podcast newscast is already televised. Do you think they might switch Newsnight the other way? I think it's possible. I mean, I think um, it is really interesting that there has been this kind of move in, in podcasting towards kind of visual mediums as well. And and also that, yes, sort of traditional audiences for visual mediums are like, oh, yes, I would like my same people on my podcast, mm. on my phone, whenever I want, while I'm doing other things. So I think it's possible. And I think, you know, we were saying uh, last time I was on the show that about kind of the, the, the winding down of the kind of investigative opportunities in sort of British media and where podcasts are still kind of mm. doing quite well at that. And, that, you know, when all the jobs were cut at Newsnight, that a lot of it was the investigative reporting that was going. And they have been the last bastion of that for quite a while. That's, that's quite not quite fair, not last bastion, but one of the sort of the few remaining. Key place for it. Yes. Yeah. So if that's what kind of keeps it afloat or keeps, you know, keeps that sort of going then great i think news night podcast yeah. is sort of almost yeah. a no-brainer yeah. you know it's it's good quality political chat get it when you wake up if you missed it in the night before um i think they can do more of those things something that comes to my mind though is actually from my chat with jamie mm. so um shout out again but um he did he explicit he said that he hates when people like make podcast video and i guess this kind of goes the other way around because when it's being filmed which obviously news night would presumably if you did that still be mm. video first um you just naturally do things that you wouldn't if, if it's audio and it like um it just means it's not such a good audio experience mm. like for example just you know gesturing at someone instead of saying the name or like not explaining something because it comes up on a banner on the screen or all, all those sorts of techniques so i think you would have to think quite you could you can't just transplant it um but I do agree with the principle that if as it, if it's like an interview and discussion thing, I mean, that's basically what a lot of podcasts are now. Yes. So yeah. I, I get that. I'll tell you what, the YouTube commenters for the media podcast last week were not happy. If you want to go and see <laughs> what they think, go and check us out on the YouTube channel. In fact, why not do this whilst listening to some brilliant ads and we'll be back with some more media news. So, retrospectors, what historical events are we ticking off on this week's run of Today in History? Well, Monday is the anniversary of the first riot of the Luddites. Then on Tuesday, we unearthed the mad coincidence of the day two different Dennis the Menaces made their comic strip debuts. On Wednesday, the day the Spanish conquered the last Maya kingdom. Thursday was the day Colonel Sanders sued KFC. And on Friday, we recall how Vincent van Gogh's sister-in-law made his name. We discuss this and more on Today in History with the Retrospectors. Ten minutes every weekday, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, welcome back. Charlotte and Rebecca here for some more news in brief. Uh, this week, the television trade body PAX issued a set of print principles for TV companies working with AI. Uh, Rebecca, there's five in total. Can you name them or any of them? Uh, yeah, I cannot run them all off in a list, no, uh, unfortunately. But um, so there's a lot of concern around copyright with yes. AI, um, getting copyright right, and, and essentially that copyright needs to be fed, or sorry, that AI needs to be fed material in order to learn a lot mm. of that is copyrighted mm. so often what it spits out is very close to what was the copyrighted material and that is something that legally we're still wrestling yes. with um there are also issues around diversity and around bias that you know again that material that's fed into ai particularly with visual stuff tends to be around you know tends to be often it it, it can be if you feel a lot of white faces in it's not going to be very good at reproducing black faces yes. or, or Asian faces. And and they kind of you end up with this kind of, yeah, this bias going on. Or, you know, if it 
takes material off the internet which is quite racist it probably will spit out racism mm. or sexism or whatever and also some of the providers have got into trouble in the last couple of weeks by uh, creating more diverse uh, nazis um and those sorts of things which is like, probably that think, was the problem with the nazi party i guess <laughs> yes, very, uh, very diverse <laughs> uh, other things they suggested um valuing human creativity mm. uh, responsibility and accountability uh, as you said uh, dni uh, minimizing that bias um, and also data privacy kind of what's going in or where it's getting this um, information from um charlotte speaking of copyright and ai we also saw microsoft in court this week trying to convince a judge in a New York Times case. Um, what are Microsoft trying to say? So OpenAI are also trying to dismiss it. Obviously, it's against both of them. And they're basically saying New York Times is over-egging it. You know, the way that it's claiming that people would use ChatGPT to, uh, and therefore reproducing their articles within it, that, that just isn't how people would use, would use it. Microsoft brought up the fact that, like, Hollywood opposed the arrival of VCRs in like the 1970s um, and, and said it's it's like that and, and it doesn't matter, but... Um, They're sort of building a new it, market and you can be annoyed at the moment, but there'll be something Exactly, more. but there is the crucial flaw in that in that VCRs didn't steal the co- <laughs> copyright. <laughs> um, they didn't generate their yeah. own movies, did Yeah, it feels, that feels to me like a crucial part that the analogy <laughs> doesn't cover. <laughs> uh, Rebecca, are TV companies excited about AI, worried about AI, or are they not getting into it yet? Mm. A bit of both. Depends which bit of the market you look at. Mm. I think there are people. Obviously, part of the writer's strikes in America Mm. was this concern about AI. And, you know, while I think we're still a really long way off, um, you know, a TV show completely, you know, the next... Well, there's not going to be next series of succession, but you know, a hyper, the next succession is not going to be written by a computer. But you know, one of the things that a lot of these writers were expressing concern about was that you know, there's kind of prep work and the sort of research and sort of you know, drawing up synopses and things that they used to get paid for, and now increasing the sort of being asked, well, you know, could you just do that as a show of willing before we give you the job? And of course, if you've got a computer that can just do it for you, you've got AI to just do it for you, then we don't need you and that's a straight a part of their income that has just gone so there is that there are parts of the industry that are embracing it um uh i think Springwatch has been using it for basically if you've got like a camera aimed at a hole a little vole or something it's yes. going to come out of and using ai to be like when did the vole come out of the <laughs> hole when did it do something interesting in the the week we had a camera mm, pointed mm, at mm. it when did the baby come out rather than have some poor research assistant have to watch a week's worth of footage and identify when anything interesting happened it can kind of so and and you know going through and so there are there is donkey work that can be taken out by ai and i think that the industry is quite interested in but it's where again it comes back to that point about human creativity and and human work that that it's sort of where is it taking sort of jobs and, and, and possibilities and opportunities away from people and taking the opportunity for creativity away. Yes, and if that's a pretty much example, it means they could look at 20 vole holes, right. couldn't they? And, as, and the one person that previously would have been able to look after a couple uh, can uh, manage the AIs uh, to find all that information. And that doesn't necessarily save you any money, but enhances your programme. Yeah. But they may not choose that option. They may choose the cash saving option. Is yeah, the and it's danger. the sort of thing, I think the New York Times thing is interesting because there's a bit of me that thinks like, there are in every newsroom, particularly in like the 24 hour news cycle, there are news stories where you're like, this is just a press release that we're rewriting. Right. And you sort of think, actually, if you could get AI to do a bunch of that and have a human read it at the end, obviously for legal things and for accuracy, that would probably free reporters to do more of this investigative shoe leather journalism that there isn't the spec capacity for. But at the same time, media owners aren't going to hear, oh, we've got the AI program that will rewrite the press releases. That means our three reporters can do mm. more involved stories. It's going to mean, well, maybe we only need one reporter which is, you know, the depressing thing, right? I think it depends on the type of company, like yeah. at, like we were talking about before about like whether it's private or public and where you can invest. But, um, I mean, NewsQuest, to be fair, like the regional publisher are doing exactly that already. Like someone in the company came up with this AI tool and they're using it to do like the press release type stuff. And then... Um, you know, when there's a big story like um, like when that tree was cut down, mm-hmm. the yeah. National Trust yeah, so yeah. they were able to send someone out like just to focus on that, and then kind of the the stuff that had to just go in the paper um, could just be kind of done by AI and then checked at the end. But it meant that someone could actually be out of the office, and I think that is quite good. But yeah, the, yeah, the issue is that not all publishers would do that. That's the thing. Yeah, my editor did, <sighs> did admit to feeding a news story into ChatGPT, and he went, "Do you know what? It actually came out not bad." And I was like, "No." <laughs> Stop it, Chris. I have, like, one marketable skill. Please don't replace me. As as someone who sends out press releases, there's a bit of me that's like, 
I wouldn't mind the AIs reading them, not to write them up, but just to flag up, this is a good one, there's something yeah. in this, that'd be really useful, uh, rather be at the mercy of people's inboxes. Yes, so someone true. can make that service, I'd be very happy. Um, it continues to be a tough time for kids TV uh, this week. BBC Kids Chief uh, Patricia Hidalgo saying that there was a growing need for third party funders from overseas. Um, what are you talking about, Rebecca? So, I mean, this is a trend across a lot of TV more widely. Um, and it is a particular issue for kids TV, I think, in some ways. But um, essentially, back in the old days, if you ran a production company, you would go and pitch your show. I want to make this show to, say, the BBC or Channel 4, to, to a commissioner at a channel. And the commissioner would say, yes, I like that. Here's the money to make it. Off you go. Now, where for various reasons, most outlets have less money than they mm. used to and production is costing more and more with as inflation happens, production inflation happens, basically the cost of everything goes up. Um, it's just costing more and more. So now commissioners are saying, cool, here's 60% of the money, go find the other 40%. And the way they're doing that is by going out to the distributors that we're seeing at places like on TV screens. There's these companies that basically just buy into um, the the production of the show. So previously, you'd have made your show, it would have been on the channel, and then at some point, the rights you'd have had the rights internationally to go and sell to these distributors. Now the distributors are coming on at the beginning, or a broadcaster in another country, so maybe an Australian broadcaster mm. will come on and give you the, the other half of the money, which means that you can make your show, and the BBC gets to show it here, and the Australian broadcaster gets to show it in Australia, and that's how it's working. But obviously that is just so much more work to do before you get your show made. And in kids TV particularly, because they don't, they, I, I'm not an expert in kids TV, but I was chatting to um, uh, Faraz Osman, who's yep. been on the podcast for a few times, who runs Goldwaller. And he was saying like, actually, you know, they only made about a hundred episodes of In the Night Garden. Mm. Because with kids, you can just show them the same thing mm. again and again and again. So like, actually those rights, being able to sell off those rights afterwards used to be really important to producers. So they're kind of, because they're having to bring them in at source or they're having to, yeah, sell them out to other broadcasters. It's just diminishing that sort of nest egg. Yeah, as I think well. someone's telling me that CBBS, obviously, it's a really cool to try and get your show on CBBS. Mm. Great chance for success. May only um, fund ten to twenty percent of a yeah. show. Uh, so the amount of work you have to do to kind of get that going, hoping you're going to flog some lunch boxes afterwards, exactly, let alone yeah. do everything else, uh, is really important. So Charlotte, do you think uh, they should hit up Redbird IMI for a bit of cash? <laughs> is that is that the answer? <laughs> I mean, they d Redbird IMI did say in their response this week, like, well, we thought the UK media was a good place to invest and clearly <laughs> not. But so, yeah, maybe get them with some non-new stuff while it's hot. Uh, maybe that's the way to go. Right. It's just enough time for the media quiz. Uh, this week entitled Top of the Pods, uh, Edison uh, Research uh, from America. They released their third quarter survey of British podcast listening. But can you guess where these popular pods land in the survey? It's a bit of fun. Other data sets are available. Uh, so buzz in with your name if you know the answer. So Charlotte, you will say. Charlotte. And Rebecca, you will say. Rebecca. Let's play Top of the Pods. Uh, you can imagine the music. <laughs> Rights issues. Uh, question number one. Uh, in the top 25 podcasts in the UK, who's at number one for the third quarter running? Number one show for UK listeners, not presented by somebody from the UK. That's not Joe Charlotte. Rebecca. Charlotte <laughs> I forgot my name <laughs> is it Joe Rogan it is the oh, Joe Rogan experience sadly <laughs> is the number one podcast uh, in the UK um uh, now the show's not exclusive to Spotify uh, I imagine it's probably going to go up even further in future quarters people just love him Sure. Some people do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, right, question number two. Uh, which show is not only at number 16 in the Edison chart, but is also the only British show in the US equivalent as well? Any more, please? Well, traditionally famous. So this is a show called Shits and Gigs. Oh, okay. uh, best friends James and Fuhad chatting with Gen Z friends uh, so black show doing well UK and US I think it's kind of interesting isn't it that there's certain things we're aware of and not aware of that doesn't mm. kind of cut through just does a really good job it also shows that Rebecca that indie podcasts can still make it yeah because I think there did used to be a bit of a thing of oh you just have your podcast on and then you know you can 
run a business off it in a couple yeah. of years and and then that sort of got walked back so yeah i think that's 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 really great there and you know like like you say they're unknowns or they're not they weren't famous before this because mm. i was going to say like um the rest is politics yeah. <laughs> so i was just like <laughs> maybe two, two best friends <laughs> yeah <laughs> sort of like, no, that's the gimmick and that's but those those shows that have the talent the mm. names are the ones that seem to be doing well at the moment well, the conventional wisdom is yes. well, you need a name to do well so i think yeah that's amazing that it's it's sort of something that is kind of coming from a sort of grassroots level mm. that's brilliant and i'm sure uh, commissioners are taking a look at that to see where they can be uh, enjoyed on other platforms too uh, okay question number three uh, what is the highest rated BBC podcast in the chart Rebecca is it uncanny it is uncanny uh, a bonus point for anybody if you can tell me what number it placed at take a guess Five? Four? Uh, number 11. Uh-huh. So out, outside the top 10. Uh, Charlotte, should the BBC be worried they can't they can't break the top 10 of this list? Well, it's good for all the commercial... Uh, <laughs> which, which, you know, uh, I've spoken a lot about all the challenges mm. the BBC posed to them. So maybe it kind of says... Don't worry, the BB, you know, it's not like the top 10 is all BBC. You've still got plenty of space and people like your stuff. So mm. it's reassuring. Yep. Uh, Rebecca, is this, could it be that BBC Sounds, um, kind of they leave some shows that are just there and it's harder for things to break out to, to everybody else? It is a strange one, isn't it, BBC Sounds? Because I can sort of see why they're doing it because you get all the data mm. and, you can, and because they have so much of a back catalogue, everything that's been on the radio as well that they can just use. That, But yeah, I do find there are some things where like... Um, the Friday Night Comedy podcast yes. I really like but it, to get the latest one you have to have it on BBC Sounds yes. and I normally have sort of my normal podcast app and then at some point I go oh wait oh that's probably on isn't it I'll go mm. and have a look but I have to remind myself to mm. go and look for content there rather than just going on my normal app so yeah does I, that I, mean I, it's worked or it hasn't worked I, I don't know though because I yeah I, there are probably times when I forget maybe I would listen more and they would have more downloads if, if, it, if it was just coming up in my regular podcast feed so I, I don't know I suspect probably that is partly what's doing it but then you wonder is that the sacrifice they're making to have that data mm. Because they must have loads of data about who's listening to what and what they can promote. And maybe that is just more valuable to them. Uh, yes. Well, um, uh, scores wise, it's what a piece. Uh, so a draw, <laughs> a draw today. Um, both of you uh, get to work together to try and get us into the top 25 for next okay. time for the media podcast. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks to Rebecca and Charlotte for joining me today. Uh, Charlotte, how can people keep up uh, with what you're doing? Check out pressgazette.co.uk. And I'm still occasionally on Twitter slash X at Charlotte Tobit. Hey, Rebecca? Uh, I'm uh, at Rebecca K. Cooney on Twitter, X, uh, at any name but Becky on Instagram. And I am, uh, you can find my work on broadcastnow.co.uk. Uh, lovely. Thank you both. Cheers. That's it for today. Remember, there's 25% off your first booking at the London Podcast Studios, where we record our show every week. Uh, just use the code MEDIAPOD when you head to thelondonpodcaststudios.com. That's thelondonpodcaststudios.com uh, for 25% off your first booking with the code MEDIAPOD. Uh, and if you're new to the show, make sure you follow us in your podcast app of choice or subscribe to us on YouTube and watch us in glorious Technicolor. Uh, my name is Matt Deegan. The producer was Matt Hill. It was a Rethink Audio production, and I'll see you next week.